Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you happen to be. Uh, thank you for joining us once again on organizing in the time of uh, COVID-19. Um, today we're going to be talking about uh, organizing uh, in, or rather uprisings in the time of COVID-19. Uh, and we're looking at Algeria. Uh, which has been experiencing a growing number of uh, um, contractions of, uh, I must say, I think nearly 400 cases and 25 deaths, which is a very high ratio. Um, and uh, the government has uh, banned travel, uh, canceled large scale events, schools, universities, mosques, and so on. Uh, and there is now even a curfew from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, and uh, everything is being shut down. Uh, people watching may recall that uh, we have seen a resurgence of the Algerian revolution of the 1960s, in a sense. Um, and uh, these demonstrations that started in February 2019, after the president, Bouteflika, announced that he would uh, run for a fifth term leading to his resignation on April 2nd, uh, but not to the true overhaul of the political system that was there, in particular the, the army, which is uh, still uh, a powerful force there. And even with the, uh, re his replacement by President uh, Tebboune, uh, there continued to be uh, a lack of acceptance of, uh, of this situation. But now we have a, a, a prohibition of rallies, marches, and every kind of organizing. Um, and uh, the Hirak has, has been stopped at what would have been, I think, the 57th consecutive week of protests against the political elite. Uh, and everything is being shut down. Um, today, we are very privileged to uh, have with us um, Dr. Hamza Hamushen, uh, who is a London-based Algerian scholar, activist, commentator, researcher, and a founding member of the Algeria Solidarity Campaign, as well as of uh, the Environmental Justice North Africa uh, uh, organization. Uh, he uh, recently joined the Transnational Institute as their North African program coordinator. So, um, a very warm welcome to you, Hamza. It's really nice to, to see you again. Uh, thank you, Firas, for having me. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's us who must thank you for sparing time to talk with us. So, Hamza, um, give us an idea of uh, what has happened to the Hirak. What is going on uh, in, in, uh, in Algeria? Um, has the uh, epidemic led to a complete freezing of the demonstrations? So before coming to what is taking place right now in Algeria, I would like to convey um, a sense of what has been happening in the country for more than a year now. And in fact, since February 2019. And actually what took place in Algeria is truly historic, the momentous events that have been taking place every week, protests, marches, where millions of people have been involved, um, men, women, old, young, um, different people from social classes, from the middle classes, to the popular classes, to the working classes, have been involved in this inspiring, um, inspiring struggle um, in order to overhaul radically the system in place. The Hirak achieved so much. It cancelled two presidential elections in April 2019 and, and in the following months in July. Um, it basically deposed a president, um, the alien Bouteflika, who has been running the country for 20 years. And more importantly, it created that collective sense of destiny. Um, People uh, suddenly felt that they are their own agents for change and their destiny is in their own hands. It was a kind of a transformative process that brought millions of people together um, in order to, 
to ask for democratic change, for freedom, and for social justice. So that has been taking place, as you said, for more than a year now, with huge protests all over the country. It's not just the capital of Algeria, but all over the country, east, west, cent central, and even in the marginalized um, south, the Sahara, where most of the oil and gas wealth and uh, wealth stands. So um, in the first week of March, um, given the exceptional global circumstances, the COVID-19 disease and the announcements by the World Health Organization um, of the disease as a pandemic, some voices within the Hirak, the Hirak, when I say the Hirak, it's the popular, it means the popular movement. Um, in Algeria started saying we need at least to temporarily hold the, the protest. But people were really wary of stopping those protests. And a lot of them were saying, not a lot of them, some of them were saying this is another ploy, deceptive ploy by the regime, trying to exhaust and undermine the Iraq. Um, and in a way, th this reflected a deep distrust in the, the current authoritarian regime. And it shows um, a deep crisis of popular, of popular legitimacy of the authorities. People just do not trust and believe what the regime is saying right now. But the Hirak showed again its wisdom and its unity and decided to halt the protest by mid-March. Um, so right now, there are no weekly protests taking place, but the Hirak in a way transformed itself into, you could say, health mobilization. And if you want, I can say more about this. Yes, that, that would be really uh, interesting. I mean, um, what would be quite helpful to understand is, you know, how is this, this, this Hirak, this mass mobilization across the the, the country. How is it organized? I mean, you know, uh, it, I mean, we can understand, you know, one spontaneous movement erupting, and but this is yeah. organized every every week uh, for a whole year. Um, and and what has what what has that created in terms of um, the movement and its aspirations? I, w w one of the things I keep thinking when I, when I read about what's going on in Algeria, is, is it still focused on the state and the, the and elections? Uh, but what about popular uh, organizing? What about uh, the, the, the alternate state uh, that could be uh, developing? Um, and which, which in the Algerian revolution of the 1960s, 50s and 60s, uh, was a real, a real uh, factor. Give us some idea about that before we come to the, the specifics of this, uh, how you are now responding uh, in, as a, sort of, in terms of health mobilization. No, th this, is, this is a very good question, Firoz, and, you know, addressing it would need a lot of time and Myself, I still grapple with that. But I think one of the undeniable achievements of the Hirak is this kind of longevity in time. It's this kind of determination to continue the struggle, despite all the difficulties and challenges. You know, um, the regime in place has all the means, has um, sophisticated repressive apparatus, um, has a huge propaganda machine, that did a lot to like attempts to divide and undermine the movement through social media, through TVs, um, and through several through several hate campaigns in order to divide the movements through ethnic lines. But th this did not succeed. The movement still went ahead and abated, um, growing stronger and stronger. And attracting, you know, new forces, uh, new forces to the struggle. But when it comes to to the organization and the structure of the movement, uh, you're right to wonder how come such a movement is going 
that far and inspiring so many all over the world and how, how is it how is it organized um i think the short answer um to this um at least according according to my views um the movement is largely leaderless um but it doesn't mean it's not organized so basically there is no political party or organization that is in the vanguard propelling it or strategizing on, on, it, on its behalf. It's largely um, non-hierarchical. Um, it's largely organized through social media where slogans are being tested, where slogans are being proposed, and even calls for protests are being proposed. So in a way, the hierarchy built that experience and trust between different sections of society to continue the struggle. And of course, there are leaders inside the movement that are symbolic figures of the movement that you know, add to the power um, uh, of, the, of that struggle. But for me, one of the reasons why we are seeing you know, such a huge movement um, in Algeria's history is due, of course, to political and economic reasons. Algeria is, is a rich um, country. It has a lot of oil and gas resources. And because of some corrupt and uh, bankrupt national bourgeoisies, as Fanon described them, um, all this wealth is being pocketed by that predatory elite and by foreign capital. So despite all this wealth and richness, you see poverty, you see underdevelopment, you see unemployment, you see illegal immigration, we call, we call it haraga in Algeria, the undocumented migrants who are still risking their lives to reach um, the shores of Europe. Um, so all this economic situation and decades of neoliberal restructuring imposed by international financial institutions led to impoverishment, uh, led to underdevelopment. And all of this is an explosive, explosive mix. And it was just waiting for, for the right moment to explode. And that happened suddenly in 2019, triggered by the attempt to maintain an octogenarian ill president at the helm um, of the presidency. Um, so all these elements came together and gave rise to this inspiring and historical movement. And I don't believe, and I don't believe that the coronavirus pandemic would stop it. And I, I just don't believe so, because it showed it's the steadfastness, the somud, what we call in Arabic, the somud. Um, it continues every week, and whatever the regime throws at it, it adapts, it evolves its slogans, it evolves its tactics. Um, so when the regime managed, for example, to impose um, the presidential elections in December 2019, there was massive boycott. And it was not a passive boycott. It was an active boycott. Hundreds of thousands of people went into the streets on the day of the elections. And the following day, when the results were announced, people were into the streets. And we, we, we see this kind of responses from that movement, which shows really radical politics, um, anti-colonial politics, linking their current struggle to the decolonization effort of our forefathers who fought, who fought the French colonialists. People are aware that the current struggle and their fight is the continuation of that anti-colonial struggle. And they chant it in slogans and in, in, in placards. They make clear that we are continuing the anti-colonial uh, anti struggle. So for me, whatever happens in the next few months with this pandemic crisis, the, I believe that the Iraq will regenerate itself. It's maybe in different forms, um, maybe using different tactics, maybe even coming back to the streets after this crisis subsides at least the health crisis, because we have other crises happening in, in, in the country. We have a political crisis, basically the political legitimacy of the current 
um, ruling classes. We have an economic crisis, a huge economic crisis that has been in the making for decades, but most recently because of austerity measures since 2016. But now um, oil prices are dwindling really fast. Um, it's I think I believe that the bar right now is just $26. And all the, Alger the Algerian budget has been planned based on a reference price of $50. So we are going into an exacerbation of the socio-economic crisis. So this hierarchy is here to stay. And I believe that it's going to show its resilience and it's going to show its popular genius once again. I, I have no doubt that the that the uh, austerity, the um, the uh, economic crisis that uh, has been a contributing factor to these mobilizations. But but is there something more? Is there is there is there not um, a uh, resurgence of uh, a popular sentiment for self determination uh, that has driven uh, this explosion? Yes, um, when we think about like the political element um, of this, uh, Algeria is still a new nation. It got its independence in, 19, in 1962. Um, so the project of the Sikh, even if it was um, ruled then by the army, the army which had the preponderant role in Algerian politics, since its independence. This, the projects, that auto-centered development projects, that delinking experience from the capitalist and imperialist order had, you could say, had, um, in, in a sense, it was a rational idea. Um, it had a clear plan. These, these things that what we want, we want to achieve mass education for our own people. We want a kind of a political and economic sovereignty. Um, however, that nationalist, that mostly nationalist development project ran out of steam by the 80s with the counter, with the neoliberal counter revolution um, that, may, that allowed the forces of the market to infiltrate Algeria and try um, to include Algeria, to incorporate Algeria into the global capitalist economy, into a subordinate position. Um, so yes, these, these protests that we are seeing, not just in Algeria, but in other countries in, in Africa, in the Arab region, in Latin America, in Asia, are in a way an expression of that global discontent, of that global system. Um, that has its cores in the, the northern economies and its peripheries, underdeveloped per peripheries in the global south. So fundamentally speaking, yes, these protests are expressing that desire to decolonize our political and economic and cultural systems, um, to delink from that system that generates poverty, impoverishment, inequality, and insert those countries into a profoundly unjust um, global order from a subordinate position. Uh, that's really helpful, uh, Hamza. Um, th there's a tendency for people to say, well, uh, it is the epidemic which is preventing these mass mobilizations. But, but actually, you know, what we're seeing is the political use, are we not, of uh, an opportunity by the ruling class to uh, prevent mobilizations. Uh, and, and so in that context, I'd really like to get some understanding of how, how is, what is the response of the, of the population? What's, how are the people now proposing to organize under these conditions? without necessarily putting themselves at risk uh, to uh, what's happening in, in many other countries, which amounts to sort of eugenics, you know, the, 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 the killing off of the most impoverished and exploited. 
Yes. So, as I said, um, the Hirak, the Algerian popular movement, is here to stay. Um, and this is not just based on just my opinion, my, my personal opinion, but is based on the experience of more than 13 months of struggle and resistance. Um, the, the Hirak faced a lot of challenges and difficulties and it maneuvered through them with creativity, genius, and unity. Um, so, yes, this pandemic is a challenge. Uh, it's not just a challenge for the Algerians, but it's a global challenge for all people in the world. Um, struggling for justice and struggling for equality and, uh, and for radical um, democracy. Um, so what, what was the response? of the Algerians to this pandemic. As I said, at first, there was skepticism and distrust of the authorities, uh, saying the authorities are trying to divide us. Um, but then wisdom prevailed, and the Hirak stopped its weekly protests by mid-March. But at the same time, the Hirak transformed. Um, Re regenerated itself into different forms. They know that the priority now is to face the health crisis. So we saw several campaigns trying to raise awareness of the health hazard of the disease. Um, and this is on the ground by young people attaching uh, leaflets about the dangers. We saw also campaigns by people to disinfect public spaces. So. So those kind of solidarity between the people are being reinforced once again. So the Hirak, um, in a way, made those solidarities resurface again. So people started believing in themselves, taking initiatives, knowing that the authorities or the regime won't protect them and won't help them. So they are taking those initiatives. And I saw some, some videos. I was really, really inspired. People taking initiatives and going to disinfect public spaces. There were all, also other solidarity initiatives, redistributing, like distributing food to hospitals, um, to, to the most vulnerable, to the elderly. There were even caravans of solidarity to um, um, the epicenter of the disease right now in Algeria is Blida, which is um, living now a complete lockdown. So people are taking medical uh, equipment, food. So the movement is still there. And for me, that's what it means. The movement is here to remain. It's showing once again its resilience. And it's going to use maybe other tactics, other forms. And for me, it's, it's very important right now to take this opportunity to reflect on the achievements, the failures, and the limitation of, um, of the popular movement. It's this time that we need to see how can we maintain that movement going in these difficult times? Um, how can we put the socio-economic question at the heart of the Hirak? How can we stop the ongoing practices um, of the authoritarian regime? As you said it very eloquently, um, the powerful of this world always um, take advantage um, of moments of crisis to either profit of them um, or maintain the status quo. And that's what exactly the Algerian regime is doing right now. Um, so the Hirak halted its weekly uh, weekly marches and protests, so it's a kind of truce. But the Algerian authorities are still maintaining the same repressive measures. Um, so some of them, for example, they are still maintaining uh, political deta detainees in prison. Um, so there are dozens of political activists from the popular movement that are still in jail. Um, there are at least four journalists um, who have been in jail for several weeks. The latest of them, Khaled Zararini, 
um, who, is, who has been dubbed as the journalist of the Hirak, has been placed in preventive detention two days ago, just two days ago. It means while the Hirak has, has stopped its, its protests and within all this pandemic, and then we have, of course, hundreds of other political prisoners since, since the 90s. Um, and then there is still the continuation of intimidation and harassment of political activists. I've seen in the news that the police, the gendarmerie, and the courts are sending letters to several political activists in the Iraq. Um, so it means more judicial intimidation and harassment for these political activists. And then a rec recent incident, which is really disheartening, to be honest. Um, so a political figure, symbolic political figure of the movement is Karim Tabu, who is a political activist and the head of a polit opposition political party. He is very popular in the Iraq, young, feisty, um, with uncom uncompromising politics um, um, to the current regime. Uh, he has been in solitary confinement for six months. And a few days ago, they extended his sentence by another six months without his, in his absence. He had a stroke um, while, while he was in the court and he has been taken to the clinic and the court continued the proceedings and charged him for another six months. So we still see the inhumanity and the ferocity of the authoritarian and, rep and repressive regime. So the Hirak sees this, and, and, and this is the dilemma. At the time that when we need urgently to be in the streets, to organize, to protest these measures, we have this pandemic that forces us to stay at home. So I think the fundamental question here, how can we resist those authoritarian measures? How can we maintain the momentum going? How can we stop the regime from regenerating itself and maintaining mm -hmm. its authoritarian um, authoritarian rules. So these are really the fundamental questions for me. And I don't have, to be honest, I don't have the answer for them. But I'm sure um, the popular masses and the popular Iraq would manage to find questions for this because the crisis is not going away. What, what's happening in a number of countries uh, has been uh, rent strikes, uh, refusal to pay debts, uh, can't pay, won't pay, uh, and even strikes uh, refusing to work even in mm. essential uh, services. Um, to what extent is that happening in, in Algeria as well? So right now I haven't seen any calls uh, for a strike. I, I think it's quite early because the Hirak stopped just, you could say, two weeks ago. Um, but I'm sure those measures would be would be in the mix because um, strikes tactics have been used in the last year uh, by several work by several trade unions and thousands of workers, and they shifted the balance towards the popular movement. Um, and there were even calls um, for civil disobedience, and as you know, civil disobedience can take several forms. Uh, not paying rent, not paying bills. Uh, and, uh, and like you, I think a, a strike should be something that the Algerian popular movement uh, should, should, should consider in this kind of circumstances, especially when you are in a lockdown. I, I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, we, we will see whether, you know, it's feasible to have a general strike, but, but to what extent are there initiatives like say, well, we're not going to pay rent because we're not working. Uh, we're not going to pay off debt because we're not working. Uh, is that happening? So the, right now, um, I haven't seen it. But in the last few months, um, especially after um, the December elections, the election, the, fraud, the fraudulent elections that have been imposed on the people, there have been several calls, especially in social media. Um, uh, 
to exercise some of these measures and initiatives of not paying rent, not paying bills, but um, I, I don't think they have a large following following so far. So let's see, let's see, maybe in the next few weeks, uh, in face of the escalation of the violence of the regime, I would call it the violence of the regime, of detaining people, of harassing political activists, I think one, one of this will be a tactic to be adopted, definitely. So, so given the, the attack by the state uh, on activists and so on, in other words, they're taking the advantage of the, the public health crisis uh, to, to hit at uh, Harak exactly. and its leadership. Um, what should we be doing? Those who are watching this, this program, those who have been in, involved what what's our response what can we be doing in solidarity so i i think this always this is always like a difficult question to answer and the one thing that comes directly to my mind is uh, talk about the algerian uprising write about the algerian uprising um, make those voices of the people on the ground be heard, um, denounce those authoritarian measures, connect the struggles in Algeria to other struggles in the, in the region and, and, and all over the world. I know these are, you could say, um, too high points, too abstract things to do, but I think they make they make a difference because if if a people, if an uprising feels isolated, it's easier. Um, for the authoritarian, repressive ruling classes to crush that kind of um, of uprising. But to be honest, one just to come back to the immediate task of the Algerian popular movement, given given the health crisis. Um, when we talk about health, the Algerian health system has been hollowed out and um, destroyed for decades now because of neoliberal destructuring, privatization, and underfunding of, of public hospitals. Um, so we are doomed to have a huge health crisis coming in, in the next few months. So one of the things that Iraq that need to be doing in this time of reflection and trying to find other tactics is to link the dots, to link the issues together and, ha and and I have been arguing for this since day one because some people wanted um, to simplistically analyze the Algerian Iraq as just a call for democracy and freedom. I was always saying we need to link the, the socio-economic issue to the democratic and freedom issue. We cannot you know separate them together and the same thing with the current context. That health issue need to be put in a context of decades of neoliberal violence, decades of people's dispossession, decades of corruption and theft of the wealth and the resources of the country. So the Algerian uprising is not just about democratic change, but it's about social justice. Um, it's about the radical transformation of the socio-economic structures um, that are dominant in the country. One of the One things of the striking about the Algerian uprising, the Iraq, has been the um, involvement of women organizing and in leadership uh, in many of these struggles uh, that have occurred. But now under conditions of uh, lockdown, um, People are being confined to home, and, and the question is: uh, Is the burden uh, it being placed excessively on women in terms of managing the household as well as having everyone at home, the children at home, and so on? And one of the things that we are seeing happening in a number of countries is an increase in domestic violence. I, I wonder what uh, the situation is in. In, uh, I, I don't think I don't think Algeria is is different. Um, so I completely agree. The burden 
would be placed once again um, on women um, and the increases of um, conjugal or house violence, as you mentioned, would be seen in Algeria too. Um, so that's why in that time of reflection, we, we need the organic intellectuals, the leaders of the Algerian revolution need to be thinking all about those issues and connecting the dots. Um, liberation cannot happen with the, without the liberation of women. And as you said, the hundreds of thousands, if not millions of women that have, par that have participated in the popular uprisings in the last year have demonstrated this. And they connected the issue of their liberation to the democratic change in the country. Just on the 8th of March, the International Women's Day, um, and it wasn't actually, um, usually in Algeria, the marches are, on Tuesday, are either on Tuesday or Friday. Well, I think 8th of March was on a Saturday. So women went to the streets on a Saturday and expressed, you know, um, their desire to see democratic change, but at the same time to see gender justice, to see equality with men. Um, and th th there was this famous and powerful slogan. Uh, they were saying, we, we did not come to celebrate. We came to uproot you. Um, so uh, I agree, these issues definitely need to be connected with, with each other. Um, it, the, we're talking about 400 uh, uh, coronavirus positive people in, in more, uh, more than that, 600, but, but with, a, with a death death rate uh, which is approaching 10 percent. Um, how do you account for that? So, um, from the last numbers that I have seen, I think there is almost 600 cases. Uh, with 35 deaths. So if, I, if I'm if i doing the maths correctly, that's around maybe 5% or maybe less, maybe less, no more, maybe 6, 7%. Yeah, um, it, it, it's still much, much higher than we're seeing in many cases now. Yeah, so uh, there may be a number of explanations for this. I just wonder whether you can give us some, some insight. Yeah, because... From what I've seen um, from the news all over the world, um, because we are, the Algerians also are not testing, so we're not testing enough. So the number of infected people is underestimated. Um, so this 600 that they are saying, I would say it could be maybe more, uh, maybe four or five times. So if it is four or five times, it means that the rate of death, the percentage of um, fatalities would, would go less. And it's the same here in the UK, the same in other countries. If you're not testing enough, uh, you don't know, the, uh, you don't have the accurate estimates of the infected people. So I, I think that's, that's the explanation. I hope that is the explanation. Otherwise, yes, I agree. It is a very, very high, high death rate. Well, this has been well, this... A, a, a really interesting uh, um, interview, Hamza. Uh, I just want to point out that uh, you've written a really interesting, really great article on the Algerian Revolution, which was uh, published in Raw Mag, uh, details of which are on the screen. Um, I, I wonder what uh, your, your next area of focus on in relation to Algeria, uh, apart from the diversion of joining us on this, uh, on this program. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, I'm I, I'm thinking of um, doing some stuff around this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, but not just Algeria, but North Africa in general, to see how we can push for just measures uh, that would resolve the issue, not to the profit of millionaires and the ruling classes, but to the benefits of the poor and the marginalized. Uh, I'm just still thinking, in the process of thinking, thinking that too. Okay. Well, I uh, really appreciate your having given us time today to, to join us. My pleasure. In the time of COVID. Uh, 
and I think there are a number of issues that you've raised that are going to be that are in common with uh, many of those who come from countries that we we, we visited, uh, and it's not merely uh, in the global south. I think it's happening in many uh, other places. But I really appreciate you having taken time to to join us, and and thank you. And if you any final message you'd like to give to our uh, uh, audience, this is your chance. I think what the final message is is to say that in times of crisis like this, um, solidarity is the message. Um, unity between the oppressed of this world is is, is the message. And like Fanon, I believe in the popular genius of the popular masses in times of crisis. People will rise up um, to those historical moments and find the solutions and hopefully, hopefully uh, usher in a radical transformation of the system, um, radical transformation that takes us to a more humane and more just and sustainable world. Okay, that's, well, that's my I'm, I'm not sure I know the, the, the secular uh, word for it, but alhamdulillah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you Pleasure. very much for being on the, on the show. Okay. Bye Thanks a now. lot. You take care. Uh, that was Hamza Hamishen uh, talking to us about the situation of organizing in the time of uh, COVID-19 in Algeria. Uh, thank you for joining us on the show. On Thursday, we will be speaking to Nimo Basi uh, from Nigeria, and I hope you will join us then. Thank you for joining us today. <laughs>